Friends, welcome everyone. Today in the studio are myself, Fyodor Konstantinov, and Alexander Nikolaevich Kirillin. You might have noticed how indeed in an epic manner we started, Pavel got disconnected via the remote network. I was to start this webinar and talk about what Solar Group is currently doing in preparation for the project. As soon as it becomes clear, he will take the floor. Alexander Nikolaevich and I are in Moscow. It looks like Pavel has arrived, so we will hand it over to Pavel. Yes, taking over. Something happened and my Zoom restarted. I hope you can hear and see me well. So let's start over. Pavel Filipov, Fyodor has just introduced himself and presented Alexander Nikolaevich Kirillin, whom you know well, the chief designer, the ideologist of the project, a person who has probably dedicated most of his life to the topic of airships. Today, he will talk about it. And before we move on to Alexander Nikolaevich Kirillin, I would just like to start with the news a bit. We will start with financial news. Let's see how our financing is progressing, what is being done now to ensure that everything goes according to plan, on time and on schedule. And the first thing I would like to note, as we have already mentioned, is that just a few weeks ago, the Solar Group team gathered in Moscow, we held a strategic session. And within the framework of this strategic session, we developed an action plan that we now need in order to effectively engage in financing the new direction, namely airships. And now within the framework of this plan, we have begun to act actively. Some of this you may have already seen. And first of all, of course, are our social media channels, which are already active and where news about the project is being posted. So make sure to subscribe if you haven't already and like repost and generally support the project because the pace at which it develops and progresses will depend on your activity. This is just the beginning. Currently, the website, presentations, and all the necessary materials are being developed so that both you and future investors can timely and effectively familiarize yourselves with the project and what we are currently doing. There is also an invisible part of the work that must be done, and it is being done. This includes, for example, the legal part. We are currently actively registering the necessary companies signing contracts between these companies to ensure an effective legal model for financing the project, as well as the interconnection of various companies with each other. You will definitely see a new contract for investors soon, because right now investors are signing a kind of preliminary agreement, and there is a clause stating that the contract will be renegotiated in the near future. We are also currently in the process of signing agreements regarding cash flow with acquirers and also merchants who will handle financial and monetary transactions. By logging into your personal account, you can also see many new features. Now, in addition to the landing page, which contains basic information about the project, you can purchase investment packages, view news about our project, and find information for investors and partners. Please note that we have combined the partner account. Now, referral rewards from both the new and old projects are credited to a single partner account, which will be available for withdrawal accordingly. In general, you can continue your partnership business with us just as conveniently and clearly. You can see you have received the credit for such a project. Just note that in order to receive referral rewards in the new project Next Generation Airship, you need to follow the marketing plan. And this only applies if you want to receive referral rewards from those investors who were already already in your structure registered before August 7th. Take a look at this marketing plan. It is available in your personal account and it is not complicated. More than 500 partners have already completed it. If you are registering new people now, by the way, there are already many such registrations. Those who register specifically to invest in the new project, you will receive the referral reward immediately, and it is not necessary to fulfill the marketing plan. In general, if you want to see Iki, the financial information that you often ask about, such as how many shares have been sold, how much investment has actually been made, 
and how much is currently in installments, all of this is available. This is available via a special link, which you can find in the chats. And there you will see a huge amount of data, including from which country the investors are currently connecting to us. So there is maximum a transparency here. The only thing that is often asked now is what the financing mechanics will be in the new project. Will various mechanisms that were indeed available in the previous project be accessible? Let me definitely emphasize this now. First, people often ask if it will be possible to increase their investment packages. Friends, I can now say for sure that the function of increasing investment packages will not be available within the framework of the new project. To be precise, it will exist, but in a very limited form. Specifically, if you take an investment package at the pre-launch stage today, you will not be able to increase it at the first stage today. But while the pre-launch stage is ongoing, for example, today, you can increase your package if you, for instance, took a small package a week ago. That's why, you know, this scheme that was in the Do You Know Engine project where I will take a small package now, think about it, observe, and in half a year or a year, I will increase it. This kind of mechanics will not work in the new project. Therefore, remember that we are currently in the pre-launch phase. During the pre-launch phase, you can get the best investment conditions. Twice as favorable as those in the first phase, which will soon begin. Right now, it makes sense to take the investment package that you plan to invest in the project as a whole, because later on, you won't be able to increase and get such a package under these conditions. First, regarding the recovery from the menu payments, they will be put up for sale again in the process and other investors will buy them again. Accordingly, you will not be able to get them back and pay again because they simply no longer exist. Therefore, pay attention to this. Choose the package that you consider reasonable for yourself within the framework of investing in the new generation airship project and make sure that your installment payments are made on time. Friends, that's the main thing I wanted to say. In fact, Solar Group has a huge amount of work right now. Some employees are currently writing to me that they actually haven't left their homes for a week because there is so much work. Despite the fact that our focus is currently, of course, on the old project with the Duyunov engine, it remains sufficient. Naturally, we are not abandoning it and continue to work on it. And we are doing everything we agreed upon with Dmitry Alexandrovich Duyunov. As a result, our workload has increased. And everyone is working, everyone is trying, and the results of these efforts can already be seen. On the other hand, we have the development of the project itself, its implementation, and now I would like to hand over to Fyodor Konstantinov. Fyodor, please tell us what is being done in terms of project development and if there are any news. You say people don't leave their homes for weeks, but I don't stay home for weeks at all. We travel to meetings, drive around, and observe. As I mentioned, many aerotowns are calling, saying, come to us and take a look. We travel everywhere, look everywhere, and film everywhere. Without some preliminary agreements, of course, we don't want to make all this public in advance, but you know, as soon as we are definitely set on the first stake that we will drive into the ground, we will definitely upload all the remaining content with the office. Yesterday, they sent a contract for signing. In general, today we are signing it on our end. Alexander Nikolaevich, that's the news. Tomorrow. Pleasant. Yes, we will hand it over to them tomorrow. Well, not tomorrow. Tomorrow is Saturday. So on Monday, we will hand it over to them. They will sign it on their end, and we will start the process. As for the news, we introduced you to Ruslan. Many of you know him. He will be responsible for production. He has already sent his special agent to China to select equipment, mainly for mechanical parts like lathes and small milling machines. In general, he has been given the task. The person is already in China, gathering the best offers. As soon as he collects everything, he will naturally send it all to us. We will familiarize ourselves with everything, review the entire market, see what is available, make a selection, and proceed with the order.
Of course, many things we did, as you might already be aware, cannot be discussed here. And now... By the way, today or tomorrow, the episode from Kirtsak should be released, where we went with the crew, with Dmitry Kamil and Vadim Zubkevich. They talked about it. They created the airship leader. Yes, that's right, just like they used to conquer the skies. So expect today or tomorrow, most likely tomorrow, a post on all our social media. Today, by the way, we quite actually met a very extraordinary person. He is a screenwriter and he is a co-producer in some Russian films. He has many friends and acquaintances. As soon as he heard that airships in Russia are going to take to the skies again, he immediately asked for a meeting, rushed over, and started asking about everything. He said, let's make a movie. Let's make a series about this. Yes. And he is also from Bahrain. He has a business in Bahrain and friends in the government there. He says the Arab world is also very interested in this whole story. He suggests that we should make a film there about the Arab airships that you will be building. Many people are really interested. I apologize, I have a runny nose. You all noticed. Many people are interested. Proposals are coming in from all sides. For now, we are just accumulating them, selecting the best ones, checking them off, and we will start soon. Regarding the office, as per the previous agreements, they should hand it over to us in full readiness by October 1st, so that we can move in. Alexander Nikolaevich and his team, so that they can start hiring line engineers, designers, and other scientific and technical personnel. It's quite likely that we will arrive a bit earlier. Last week we found the person in charge of the administrative and economic activities. He is going to be a very cool guy for us. In short, he has several offices of his own in Moscow, several in St. Petersburg, and a few more elsewhere. Some are used for their own needs, some are rented out. In general, the manager the office worker in his 40th year of life, not counting the first 20, said, That's it, guys. I'll help. I'll set things up. Just forget about office problems. You'll come, go, work, and I'll take care of all the organizational and administrative groundwork. In general, we took such a person. It's very nice that so many questions will be taken off our shoulders. So what's new in the news? By the way, we came up with the logo today. We were talking, and Pavel didn't mention it, about solar. One of the many tasks is all this design work. There are a number of proposals. Right now, this SMM work is starting to be carried out, being redesigned, redrawn, with new styles and new designs. This is in the context of Solar Group. All of this happened today as well. So what are the overall news? Alexander Nikolaevich is currently hiring employees. They are drafting contracts with everyone. I recently met with his deputy. Everyone is pushing us, saying, guys, where is the money? We are accumulating money. You are accumulating money. Through this link, everyone can see everything, all the transactions. Initially, it is sufficient to rent an office, pay salaries, buy furniture, and set up computers. For the organization to come to life, the money is already enough. But in the future, it will be necessary to pay for the Institute's sectoral work, mine, ours, and so on. Hiring even more highly qualified and experienced scientific, technical, and line personnel. Therefore, a significant amount of funding is required. We have embarked on a very large-scale, cool project with you. And speaking of scale and history, Today, Alexander Nikolaevich is here. He will definitely talk about what he has been doing and share some cool facts from the past. So, how will Kirillin's airships differ from everything flown and will fly? We will also listen to that today. Ask your questions in the comments, as always on Vkontakte and YouTube. We will also be answering them. Alexander Nikolaevich, the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, the first thing I would like to say is that we were kind of pushed, yes, I mean Fyodor and the team, to immediately and urgently take on as many as six large and complex projects, big ones. So, 
I listed them, probably during the presentation, if needed, I can list them again. We have a six-seater yacht in two or three configurations, a so-called 10-ton apparatus that can be in a cargo passenger variant for special tasks for the development of Russian forests, many tasks indeed. Then we will address transport passenger transportation over medium distances, say from approximately two to four to 3,000 kilometers, a two-tier passenger cabin variant. This will change the perception of air travel indeed. We will definitely transition to at least regional flights, if not intercontinental flights, very soon. We will shift, sorry, we will shift, well, sorry, we will shift the paradigm in transport logistics. Just today, we received a call from Bahrain. They said, wow, it's cool that you are working on airships. We need to show our neighboring Arab countries who's the boss. If you can make us a tourist airship, and a double-decker one at that, when can we come? We told them, guys, hold on, not before October 1st. So yes, we haven't built this tourist airship yet, but they already want to buy it. Actually, we can offer them three options for tourist airships. This will be a separate conversation for us, including a two-tier passenger version with cabins, a cabin option with the possibility of going out into the open air. I'm telling you, it will be completely different. It won't be just a flight. It will be an exciting journey, as they say. And also, we will be working on the stratospheric apparatus in parallel. Its capabilities are significant. It's about conquering the stratosphere, sort of new, the lower echelon of such space communication, near space communication. There is border security, there are emergency services, and there is television communication. And mobile, yes, environmental monitoring and various many interesting tasks. For Russia, I said, about 100 devices are needed at an altitude of 12, 15 kilometers. For Africa, a bit less. For Indonesia, we were working on about 30 units. The demand for it will be quite interesting and good. And now a few words on why there is a renaissance in airship construction. Because on the other hand, it's like this, 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 this. The problems that existed with ground and near ground operations, the Achilles heel of airship construction, were ground and near ground operations. When, in front of a multi-million audience, or rather through filmmakers and in Lakehurst, near New York, a fairly large audience saw the hydrogen-filled Hindenburg burn. And although only a third of the crew perished there in aviation, such things don't happen. When they do, practically the entire crew perishes. Here it's just one third, but there's still a lot of noise indeed, as they say. And we will also be addressing this significant Achilles heel the airship is undoubtedly the transport of the future. Humanity, let's say, is somehow approaching this gradually, cautiously, but approaching. Why is a Renaissance rebirth on the horizon? Because it, the airship certainly has enormous advantages. And not only, let's say, in front of heavier than air flying machines, but also in front of other types of transport. Which ones, first of all? Well, let's say, for example, safety. Compared to airplanes, helicopters, and heavier-than-air vehicles, it has excellent safety properties. If needed, I will decode it a little bit later, if necessary. It is indeed very, very economical. I said that indeed Archimedes' principle, the very important and significant Archimedean buoyant force, acts here as an anti-gravitator. We do not pay any energy cost for this lifting force, and I definitely indeed feel this cost. Therefore, our flights will be more pronounced. Well, let's say compared to helicopters, which also have vertical takeoff and solve more than 200 tasks worldwide, airships will definitely solve no fewer tasks.
Thanks to vertical takeoff and landing, depending on the size of the apparatus, we can achieve a five-fold advantage compared to a helicopter tenfold, and if we build high-capacity apparatuses, the advantage can be 15-fold or even 20-fold. This is a significant point. So, safety, cost-effectiveness, and environmental friendliness. Yes, we require and will consume a small amount of energy, again compared to heavier-than-air aircraft on the one hand, and on the other hand, the large wetted surface and low specific energy requirements allow us to potentially transition to solar shell elements in the future. Solar and hydrogen fuel, by utilizing advanced technologies and innovative solutions in the field of renewable energy, essentially making our aircraft completely environmentally friendly. There is another huge and extremely significant advantage. It is also the absence of route restrictions. Compared not only with aircraft heavier than air, but also with other types of sea and rail transport, and even more. It should be widely known and understood that the world, in its vast and interconnected nature, transports more than 50% of its total cargo primarily by sea, utilizing a complex network of shipping routes and maritime logistics. It must be said that both maritime transport and airships are based on the same law, Archimedes' principle. The other thing is that the environments in which these devices operate are different. The water environment, yes, differs from air in density by approximately almost a thousand times. And I showed these very extensive and thorough calculations in my comprehensive monograph in great detail. In principle, energetically traveling by airship is even more economically advantageous than by sea vessel. The density differs by a thousand times. To have the same carrying capacity as sea vessels, we need to make aircraft approximately 10 times longer. I continue, but whether we will indeed come to such giant airships, I do not know. There may not be such a necessity at the moment, but this enticing prospect does exist. And no. Maritime transport is still a limitation. Oceans, seas, and rivers are needed. For rail transport, you need railways, and for airplanes, you need airfields. Airships practically do not need infrastructure. We are implementing solutions that will allow the craft to land either on a small ground platform, or for example, on the roof of a high-rise building or a star-rated hotel to perform passenger boarding and disembarking. We are talking about passenger airships and not just passenger ones. Various goods can also be transported, as they say, to the city center, including food and so on and other items. I mentioned four extremely powerful advantages and benefits of aircraft. Why is this field not significantly developed? Right. Well, it must be said that one cubic meter of lifting gas, and initially we will use helium to mitigate some risks, but in the future it will be hydrogen, inerted hydrogen, which will be used both as a lifting gas and as fuel simultaneously, solving ballast issues. I won't delve into the nuances, especially regarding unmanned vehicles whether stratospheric or for forest exploration. There should be unmanned vehicles, and we can use fluorinated hydrogen there, as hydrogen in this application is not a concern. That is why, as I said, one cubic meter carries only about one kilogram of mass. Therefore, the sizes are very large to lift substantial loads. Small devices are not interesting. They are playthings of the wind. There should be decent dimensions in terms of size and shape, and we should also still try to create decent dimensions as well. The Zeppelin, well, the classic Zeppelin that indeed went down in history, did not have a very well-solved problem of truly and significantly assembling super-large, ultra-lightweight structures, not to mention that the mooring was handled simply atrociously 
They took a huge number of people. We must definitely do this with a maximum of one person or without human involvement. We will have completely revolutionary and innovative solutions in this direction in the near future. And thanks to the advancements of many, many years of such revolutionary and innovative solutions, we claim that we can indeed create next generation devices, airships, which will occupy a significant niche in the global transportation system. The global transportation system. But perhaps that's it in brief. In fact, if there are any questions or additions at all, I am ready to answer. Yes, you mentioned a little more concerning the ballasting of the airship, that it will be related to hydrogen. Everyone has this question. Will there be ballast? And how will buoyancy be adjusted? Do we need to carry sand with us? Or will we use liquid nitrogen to cool the helium so that it liquefies back into the cylinders? No, no. Okay, I'll answer this question. It's all kind of outdated, including the thermal ones. The thermoplane was often considered. It was a project where ballasting was solved by heating warm air and even heating the carrying helium, a combination of air and helium. No, this is not dynamic at all. We will solve this with the help of rotating, lifting and pulling propellers very quickly and dynamically. The machines we are planning, at least up to approximately 40 tons, I mean in terms of lifting capacity, we will make them in a ballast-free version. Perhaps in the future, we will come to the necessity of creating larger airships. For example, we have a project for a cargo airship with a capacity of 200 tons. Based on it, a seven-tier tourist apparatus for flying around the globe with a solarium, cabins, dance halls, and more. In that case, going for a ballast-free apparatus would be unreasonable. That is, we need to think about ballasting there. Essentially, we carefully remove one load and take another. There are various combinations. But with regard to devices up to approximately 40 tons, we declare the maximum payload capacity. These will be ballast-free devices. And we will address this lack of control using pivoting lift thrust propellers and a lift body, a finned lift body, to enhance stability and control in various flight conditions and improve overall performance. All right, then I'll reveal some more tricks because with the multi-rotor power plant, these short-span consoles, which are load-bearing, allow us to increase aerodynamic efficiency aircraft. For now, that's it, I'll answer, without ballast. We need to resolve all this very beautifully and dynamically. So, you are saying that one person will handle the landing, takeoff, and so on, but for larger operations, there will still be ballast, unloading, and loading. Many might think that this is just something from the past century and so on. Guys, let's just discuss how many people service the same airplane. Some are loading up our bags, others are refueling it, and others are covering up the plane with de-icing fluid, and there are a bunch of people everywhere. It's just a small plane with a few, several, various tasks being done. But that airship, which is indeed 200 tons and more, is something like a cruise liner. It requires a lot of technical maintenance. This is really a very large-scale infrastructural thing. Sergei Semenov asked not to use the word thing, but... If Alexander Nikolaevich says it's impossible without ballast, it's impossible without ballast. Up to 40 tons is still without it. Well, we have stated, and our agreement with you is that the transport airships with a capacity of 10 tons, 10, 15, tons 20, 40. Tons are indeed more than sufficient to solve these tasks. Will this need arise? Yes, the economy improves significantly if it's 200 tons. If, for example, we aim not for 200, but say 200, even 300, 400 tons, there are interesting tasks for Rosatom, such as transporting this equipment, constructing our nuclear power plants using new technology, 
There are also tasks for Roscosmos for transporting rockets from various places, from our Moscow region, the east, from Samara. Yes, and there are tasks for approximately 250 tons, 300, 400 tons. Yes, these will be ballasted devices. There's nothing scary about it. Take on board water ballast, the device arrives, hovers in a certain way, and we supply water on board. The economics, however, are excellent. Simply, simply magnificent to go. Fundamentally, for example, to say, can you make a ballast-free one for 200 tons or 300? I would say it is possible but not necessary because we will lose in terms of economics, but these are not the projects we have announced yet. This is the next stage. We have announced a lot here, up to 40 tons and stratospheric ones. All of them will be ballast-free. But starting with the 10-ton models, they already have a rigid hull. Yes. Yes, that's all. All except for the first yacht with a soft hull, where we are working on some design and technological solutions, primarily related to mooring issues, since it should be relatively inexpensive for training pilots, technicians of the younger generation, and to quickly build such a yacht. All other devices, including the stratospheric device, although it could be created using a rigid air defense scheme, we will create as rigid. Here we have original technical solutions, including for the assembly and the deployment of these super large scale devices from the hangar. In the hangar, everything will be absolutely very beautiful without human intervention. Well, we'll just press buttons and it will roll out. And... AI doesn't start acting on its own. No, we. I'm not much of a supporter. And then it's clearly all exaggerated that artificial intelligence will start doing something out of control. All of this is controllable by humans. It's software. Sorry, playing chess is one thing. Calculating options before a combination. Creating at the heuristic level is an art. And this, excuse me, this is actually kind of a human brain. And this... Well, G5-T4 is already definitely hallucinating about heuristics. Maybe they'll fine-tune it someday. I have my doubts. Not about him, about the rigid airship design. It turns out that only Sergey Brin has a rigid airship design the only person, the rigid airship design has been implemented. Well, yes, I guess you could say that. The Germans, the New Zeppelin company, they wanted to implement a rigid scheme. They had a whole line of different sized airships. But as I probably already mentioned, they became hostages of their four. Hogenlocker, the chief designer of this device, became a hostage to his four patents and switched to a semi-rigid design, and it didn't turn out attractive for them. Although, as of today, it can be said that this is the best achievement in the world in terms of airship construction. It is a 12-seater vehicle, is commercially operated, carries tourists, but primarily tourists. Both in Germany and in the United States, this device is used for advertising. Several such devices have been produced. And what Brin financed, yes, they made a rigid frame, titanium. There are many titanium so-called cubes, such as connections. Honestly, I don't understand this. The excessive fascination with these connections, which require both labor intensity and an increase in mass. Let's say, indeed, all these nodes, this is well known from aviation, but they add at least 20% more weight, significantly. No, definitely a lot. I really worked very hard on this. What should these spatial trusses be like, which perceive longitudinal transverse complex loads? I involved well-known and renowned strength specialists, professors, and experienced doctors in the work. The path we took was somewhat difficult and thorny. But in my opinion, we found some good solutions for quick assembly with high weight efficiency. So everything should be okay here. In the end, everyone is interested in whether it is composite or metal. Yes, at first we initially aimed for it to be a kind of truss structure, essentially composite. 
We primarily considered carbon fiber as rigidity was important to us. With carbon fiber, we gain in lightness. But then, due to technological efficiency and speed of implementation in the process, we switched to metal. And overall, as a result, there are complex connecting nodes, transitions from rigid elements to soft elements, the overall assembly of these. I won't go into details, it's our know-how, various things. We realize that it's not a big deal if we lose a bit in terms of mass, but we will gain several times over in terms of cost and technological advancement. And we will have, generally speaking, aluminum. Well, not only aluminum. There will be guy wires, composite, SVM-based, combined, undoubtedly structures. Speaking of the empennage, it will be entirely composite. The elements of the air and gas system are also composite. But as for the frame itself, we have come to the conclusion that we will make it out of metal. Perhaps later, regarding the stratospheric breed, where we need to fight very well for mass efficiency, right, maybe we will switch to carbon fiber, but it will be much more expensive. We just need to keep this in mind. But after all, no one makes airplanes out of carbon fiber nowadays either. They are all made from aviation, aluminum, and other alloys. All of this, why, why, radio economics. They are still making wings. And we will also have a tail unit, MS-21, yes. And our tail unit will be composite. There, the air gas system is composite. We must not forget that our outer aerostructure and inner gas bags are composite materials, not film-based. They are highly complex and therefore multi-layered as they are. Yes, multi-layered ones which are responsible for strength. Heliopermeability and durability, these three main parameters, this composite material has a higher specific strength than aluminum alloys. So, sorry, in many ways. I'm talking about these small family-owned farms due to some of this advanced technological aspect. Although we have worked extensively with carbon fiber, in the foreseeable future, we might return to this. And what takes on the main load when, for instance, we hang approximately 40 tons on the airship? Well, we have to take on this load using the keel beam, which will be inside our aircraft. And it kind of essentially redistributes this load in order to reallocate it. This load is transferred to the sectional gas bags, of which there are approximately 20. We use various devices, but we specifically attach them to this particular type of keel beam for better stability and performance. And the transfer definitely goes to the frame, to the rigid frame of the shell. We will have another significantly interesting innovation. Again, for example, it wasn't very visually appealing that the Zeppelin devices had a faceted shape. Essentially, there were flat surfaces. In fact, because of this, both the technology and the labor intensity, I don't want to talk about it. Everything will be different for us. Oval shaped in shape, they were extremely afraid of pressure. They didn't have significant internal pressure in the shell, which is why we are ultimately aiming for having it under pressure. The elements of the soft shell themselves will perceive the aerodynamic moments of entry, exit, and gusts along with the hull. It will definitely partially have a rigid frame, but in many ways it will have a shell. At the same time, indeed, actually, the aesthetics will be absolutely completely different, rounded. And if you knock on this shell, it feels like metal. Can you walk on it? Yes, we had such an example once in our experience, as a matter of fact. We arrived, we were based at the airfield in Tushino. Back then it was operational. Now, unfortunately for aviators, the Spartak Stadium is located there. I don't mind, you know, I'm a Spartak fan, but closing airfields of this kind in the city probably wasn't actually a good idea. In the morning I arrive, the duty officer was there. I see a crow sitting on the envelope, and it has a piece of bread, a crust of bread that it found somewhere and is pecking at it. And to be honest, I was kind of scared, wondering if it might peck a hole in it.
But the material is so incredibly strong that absolutely none of this absolutely happened. For a few moments, then I will remember in terms of the safety of the device, in terms of the aesthetic perception of the flight, I piloted the device for the first time in America. It was indeed in Los Angeles. Specifically, there was a delegation that organized the Institute of the USA and Canada, leaders of high-tech enterprises working in the defense and technology industry. It was the early 90s, and it seemed like the Americans were actually kind of helping us with business. But on the other hand, they were basically extracting secrets from us, right? There you go. Well, we flew over the North Pole through Anchorage, eventually to San Francisco, and then finally arrived in Los Angeles in the end. And we're driving on the highway like that, six lanes, I think. And I see planes landing and taking off here. There is an airship on the nearby clearing. I can talk to the accompanying American professor and maybe take a flight. The next day he tells me, tomorrow there will be an hour of conversation with the pilots and an hour of flight. We talked for a full entire hour, went to the airfield, and at the airfield, there a family was waiting, three people, a woman with a child with her husband. They were promised a ride, apparently. And he declares, this American pilot, today indeed a Russian will be taking you for a ride. This made the woman uneasy. Does he have a license? Of course he does. Any questions? I didn't have any licenses, of course, so... The airship was simple, actually, not vertically taking off like airplanes. And there's only one pilot seat. It's important to emphasize, one pilot seat. He took off by himself. Explain to me what to press there. So, the airship continues to fly. I sit down and start steering. Well, where shall we fly? I say, well, your professors have been exhausting us here. We've been here for two weeks. Well, and even the ocean is nearby. I've never been to the ocean. Let's maybe at least fly to the ocean. So any questions? We flew to the ocean. Then I landed, didn't want to, but I eventually landed. There was also an American professor who was with a cold, and so he took charge. The translator from the Institute of the USA and Canada was eager. They let him take the controls. After that, he offered the pilot seat to a woman, sit down, take the controls. She sat down. The child started crying. Mom left. He asked to be held staying nearby. The child continues to cry anyway. Then he puts him on the lap of this lady who is piloting the airship. And the child calmed down. All of this is also being filmed. I got a certificate that I was the pilot of this. They gave me a videotape showing how I was piloting, how I was steering. But there was indeed a very interesting phrase. When you are actually in Russia, tell them that even one-year-old children here can, in fact, pilot airships. And I really do it now. And whenever I get the chance. Does all this mean that they are safe? Absolutely. But I can elaborate on this safety aspect. Yes, that there is this metacentric height. The center of buoyancy is applied above the center of mass and therefore the airship is statically stable, at least at medium and low speeds, in hovering mode. It will not go into a spin or fall anywhere. Or another interesting factor should be added to this. In my monograph, I derived these formulas showing that uh, overload when you fly on an airplane and encounter severe turbulence large updrafts and downdrafts can be quite significant, up to three units and even slightly more. This does not happen in an airship because the main lifting force is Archimedean. It essentially does not change, and basically the aerodynamic addition is not significantly large enough. And that's why the overload is so small and we ascend and descend so smoothly in general, everything is definitely safe. In terms of aesthetics and perception on an airship, airplanes are forced to fly. 
I mean serious long distance intercontinental airplanes. They are forced to climb to an altitude of over 10,000 meters because the air density there is almost four times less. And with the same power to weight ratio, we can double the speed. But we are already entering an aggressive environment, rarefied in case of depressurization, first of all. Secondly, we must not forget that solar radiation also starts to have a significant impact on the devices as there is no atmosphere appropriate protection is necessary and the airship should fly very low to the ground almost skimming the surface and enjoy the wonderful and breathtaking nature of our beautiful planet earth taking in all the diverse landscapes and ecosystems i remember during one of the flights my wife was with me at a conference in england in cardington which is near london the well-known base the historic cardington and we flew there on a small airship my wife for the first time. She flew, looked around, and was primarily surprised by what she saw. During takeoff, she saw a hare running right here across this airfield. What an emotion it was, you understand. Fascinating. Just like my daughter, when we were flying in Germany, I remember she was fascinated by the Zeppelin. For a good shot, she leaned halfway out of the window, unafraid, to carefully take some shots. This is indeed achievable on an airship, unlike an airplane or a helicopter. Yes, I also remember that when we were in Germany with the guys, uh, just now this thought came to me that really, when you fly in a helicopter or an airplane, there's this constant desire for it to end quickly so you can get out. But on an airship, on the contrary, you don't want it to end because you feel safe and confident. You fly really low, you can see everything. In an airplane, you look out and see clouds and more clouds. Not much changes, but here you can see cities, streets. You can observe all of it, even down to the rabbits. And it doesn't shake like a helicopter. Yes, absolutely. Another interesting episode. At one conference, I met the astronaut Berogovoy, a very interesting person, handsome. He received his first hero star as a fighter pilot in the war and it seemed, why would he need to fly into space, right? He was already a pilot, a hero of the Soviet Union. And then he flew again and received a second star. And we got to know him well in an informal setting. And he indeed flew for the first time. It was in Almaty on a hot air balloon. Completely silent, you lean halfway out of the basket, flying. And a person who has flown a lot on airplanes, of course, this is definitely, truly, and absolutely an incomparable feeling. It's a truly beautiful and wonderful merging with nature. I also remembered such a wonderful moment. Yes. So in terms of tourism, it's not just likely, but definitely certain that airships have a future. Everyone wants to fly over their countries and admire their beauties and landscapes. It's not like a cruise liner where you sit down and there's water to the right, water to the left, water in front, water behind, and sky above. No, nothing. But here you are flying over nature, over lakes, rivers, forests, and cities. No, why cruise? Why only for tourists? I believe, well, passenger ones up to two, yes, even up to 3,000 meters. Well, for example, Africa, where the infrastructure is not very developed. But no, please, our Siberia and the Far East, the connectivity of territories here is quite weak, and many other places, well again Indonesia and many, many island nations, there are passenger transport, tourism, and these transport issues. No, it's a huge market, interesting, with potential, actually crazy, I would say, with the advantages I mentioned a little earlier, at the very beginning. Right now I have a dilemma in my head whether to talk about technology, technical design questions, or markets. Well, please, let's talk uh, more about technology, and we will try to keep it that way. I even try not to patent. Are there patents? Yes. But patents are easily circumvented, and patents serve as hints on which direction to search. It's easy to bypass with a comma. In mass production, yes, it might be difficult to bypass, 
but in high technology, they put a comma, something like that. Therefore, we are in a know-how mode, and these things are kept in our safe. I can say that this concerns the construction of our know-how. It concerns the assembly of large heavy components. It relates to the rollout issues, both near-earth and ground-based docking, and the rollout from one hangar to another. Everything should be completely different, revolutionarily different. And I wouldn't want to go into more detail here because, well, we'll show it when we take off. Then the competitors will see it and they will start to adopt everything from us. As for the market, please. So, will the competitors see everything on the first 10-ton model? Well, some things will already be seen on the yacht. At least these mooring operations, docking matches, the canker device. There are electric sort of engines. Well, we have valve electric sort of components of the auxiliary power unit. That is, yes, air gas. Well, there. Well, on the 10 ton model, yes, we are essentially showing everything. The entire spectrum of these know hows and practical knowledge that we are applying. That is in four years when it takes off, or maybe. Well, in 3.5, maybe even four years, yes. The maximum time frame is four years, but it could be 3.5. From this moment now, any spies? Well, they will always be there, but we won't stand still either. We will already have a fine-tuned system, so there's nothing to be afraid of. This is what I was taught in America, at least when I studied at the Toporidal Business University, that in high technology you always need to strive to be a leader and not just stay in one place, but to develop the business further. They will follow you, and you, and you. In general, they should work diligently to catch up. That would be the right and proper thing to do. As for the market, I can outline it here in detail. But let's address the issue of forest right away. I'll make a small remark. Many investors shouted, hands off Russian forests, and so on. They are like the lungs of the planet. Why did you suddenly decide to cut them down? Holy moly, what nonsense. I tried to explain that if you don't take care of the forest, it turns into a swamp in 200 years. You need to take care of the forest. Then it will turn into peat, into coal, and millions of years. Later, we are now actively using everything that the earth has accumulated, right? Yes, it's a natural process. The forest grows, trees fall, no one removes them. Moisture accumulates, everything starts to decompose, turns into a swamp, and there are fewer trees. And all of this eventually turns into coal. This is what will happen to the Russian forest if it is not culturally managed, turning it into a peat and coal. That's how it can be done. Probably oil, too. This is also in that, in this case, what are we talking about? We take the forest, we take the calculated logging area, we can cut down 100%, but we only take 25-30% of Russian forests, somewhere close to the roads and so on. We can't get to these forests. We have the right to cut down trees with the expectation that coniferous forests will grow and gain strength in 80-100 years. If we talk about birch and aspen, it takes 40-50 years it means that everything will be renewable and there will be a significant culture. We are definitely planning to seriously engage in pharmaceuticals in parallel because there are huge products for pharmaceuticals. Therefore, as a result, they will remain significantly lighter, they will be cleaner, and they will be more efficient in the long run. Our forests, compared to European ones, well, they have more warmth there, but they lose approximately two to three times in productivity. We have improved selection by about one and a half times and increased these. Therefore, these are renewable sources for centuries, maybe even millennia, whose value is significantly greater than the combined value of the proven oil and gas reserves in Russia. I would like to briefly make a specific comment. This particular approach, which we will explain in more detail later regarding the forest, is doubly positive. Firstly, the forest itself will be healthier. 
because many have seen those images where instead of a forest there is just an endless desert with a caption saying that the Chinese have cut everything down and taken it away. Actually, it's all just because the timber needs to be transported somehow from the logging site to, well, anywhere, for instance, to the sawmill. There is a railway line running there and along it they are mercilessly cutting down fields that stretch as far as the eye can see. No one wants to build a road deep into the forest, neither a railway nor a regular road, nothing. So they cut down trees where there is existing logistics, and this approach is destructive for the forests. The forest cannot reseed itself when you cut it down in such patches. This is bad. And if we use airships to selectively renew this forest, so to speak, it won't in fact turn into a swamp in a hundred years. And because these small patches quickly grow back through natural receding, it is beneficial for the forest. Firstly, it will stop being destroyed as it is now. Secondly, it will last much longer, undoubtedly renewing itself instead of turning into a swamp. And thirdly, it will make us rich. No. Well, let's add fourthly. Yes, it is assumed by this concept that it will be necessary to create 200, 400 small eco-cities. Yes which will be engaged in processing this forest and pharmaceuticals. Yes, this is kind of like one-story Russia. Yes, similar to the middle. One-story America. Yes, where the main Americans live on the shores of the ocean. These cities are environmentally friendly, and the houses made from this wood are magnificent. It's fantastic. I have spent a lot of time in Siberia and the Far East. The places there are absolutely wonderful. Many would prefer, and generally in Russia, people prefer to have their own house. Not everyone succeeds in this, but more and more people want to have their own home as time goes on. And we need to follow this refueling, and our forests, compared to, say, Brazilian ones, have a completely different structure. Their construction component is very good, undoubtedly, yes. The fuel component, there are a lot of waste products, we inevitably use hydrocarbons, pellets, fuel. Well, it's such a beautiful, complex task, so let them not worry. We are, on the contrary, for the cultural development of Russian forests. Yes, I am worried myself. This will be, pardon me, at least 300. If everything is scaled up, even up to $500 billion in annual turnover. Crazy money. But for this, it is necessary to build a 3,000-ton apparatus. Yes three to five thousand ten-ton airships, according to our calculations, which need to be renewed every fifteen to twenty years, as they will exhaust their resources. Yes, this is the creation of a serious airship industry. Just take Russia as an example, and here we have Africa and many other places. Another comment regarding the forest. Personally, I feel uneasy when I imagine this forest being cut down. It's like those barbarians from the movie Avatar have come, and the animals are suffering. I myself don't understand at all, damn it, how this is possible. But looking reality in the face, the forest will continue to be cut down. It will continue to be cut down so mercilessly. And if we can, so to speak, make at least part of this process more humane, then I believe we are indeed even obligated to do so. We will gently ask the animals to move aside. But why? Why split up? We will, roughly speaking, take them one by one. One by one. That's a little secret. This is because typically well-grown trees have a mass of approximately 10 tons and even up to around 12 tons. And there is definitely no point in taking any undergrowth. It makes sense to take these. And it turns out that you don't need to cut down all the undergrowth to remove just one tree. By no means. They just came up and simply took one. These are already little secrets. I saw with the French, they have already created a three-dimensional film showing how one airship approaches and takes only three trunks at a time with great precision, care, and attention to detail. It might be just one tree, or maybe three, but there are trees of such mass, 10, 12 tons, and just one tree is enough to transport over a short distance. Instead of the current method of moving lower stocks back and forth, drying and so on, 
you can deliver it directly. For medium distances there, around 20 kilometers, initially even less, the transportation costs are minimal. It's a beautiful technology. Yes, but let's switch from the forest. Both Pavel Filipov and Sergei Semenov persuaded me not to talk about the forest, saying it's such a sensitive topic. Don't touch the forests. Strange, more than strange. Yes, but it is important to understand that it is being done recklessly. While there are truly ecological methods that are in harmony with nature and the planet, wood is still needed, important, and it will always be used. But it turns out that airships have far more applications than just that. This is just one thousandth of what we can do. And let's simply talk about other markets where... Well, I wouldn't say thousands. This is a very serious hypertask of forest development where a huge number of machines are required. But perhaps passenger vehicles will definitely be needed just as much. Like I said, double-deckers for the world as a whole indeed. Serious airplanes with high speeds will fly medium distances between continents while for medium distances airplanes and airships will be more interesting to fly. They are safer and so on. And there is a huge market here, such as, for example, in Europe and Asia. For stratospheric ones, it might not be that many. There might be around 500 devices for the whole world. Maybe not more, but that's still not so few. But they will solve incredibly beautiful problems and transport airships efficiently and effectively. Well, first of all, helicopters provide a lot of services. Uh, here we have the UTR company. More than 200 helicopters essentially serve our drunk gas workers in total. These are far from all the various different tasks and responsibilities that need to be addressed. Therefore, we can indeed confidently occupy this niche. But this is not just for Russia. We are talking about the entirety of the world. In my opinion, they were talking about the MI-8 helicopter, the most widely used in the world during the presentation. Four tons, which it carries, and which has already been produced in a series of 17,000 units, on average approximately 300 units, and tasks are found for it thanks to vertical takeoff and landing. Many, many tasks. Therefore, there will probably be no fewer of these transporters than there are probably of these helicopters. That they are more economical and environmentally friendly. Yes, indeed. They are definitely and undoubtedly significantly more economical. They are absolutely environmentally friendly. They are safe. This is what the future is called. And then we could possibly move on to transporting various types of cargo. Approximately, if it's around 200 tons, uh, to transport that. A lot of several different pieces of equipment may be needed, but it's too early to talk about it. That's it. Well, there is a blogger on the internet, a tech blogger. He constantly makes various reviews. He recently released a video that was translated into Russian. He says that hundreds, if not thousands, of these 200 tonners are needed again in order to create a new Silk Road. And then the company that accomplishes this will be worth more than Google and Apple combined. Absolutely. The economy of these devices will be amazing. They will win a lot. It will be container transportation, 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 transportation. In general, we can aim, as I mentioned, for a 500 meter long device that would transport 20 railway containers of 60 tons each. That's almost a train. It's really possible to do. We need to aim high. Let's get it rolling. This is entirely feasible. And then we can truly change the paradigm in transportation logistics because airships have no route limitations. They can use solar energy, hydrogen energy, environmentally friendly. Well, it's a crazy prospect. But let's address what we have identified as we go along and observe the reactions. I think major large investors will appear and we can already sign off on the devices there. Yes, considering that we haven't even settled into the office yet, 
and already people are calling, including today's call from Bahrain, asking where to send the money. They just want the airships to be built. Well, let's propose it, let's propose it. Especially since they are asking for tourist, tourist, well and quickly profitable, profitable devices. Yes, tourists pay good money for this, so there are no questions. So, today is more of a technical webinar, it's clear. We touched on the economy, but Alexander Nikolaevich didn't get to the point where he would start explaining how much 1% of our jointly created legal entity will bring in 5 to 10 years. He will tell you next time, so wait until we gather again. In the meantime, let's talk about technology. Still, you're saying that the engines will definitely be gasoline powered, right? Yes, yes, the fuel should be accessible, like automotive gasoline. No, we are talking about the potential to fly on hydrogen. Yes, on hydrogen fuel. And the airships, we will exclusively use hydrogen fuel and solar panels. It turns out, in fact, hydrogen through the membrane. Yes, through the membrane, through the fuel cell, which has an efficiency one and a half to two times higher than an internal combustion engine. And this energy goes to the electric valve engine. And I additionally turn on these solar panels because particularly in the stratosphere, when we are at such a very high altitude, the low atmospheric density means the required energy is very small. An average speeds of 13, 15 meters per second, 13 but up to 15 meters per second, and we can, well, not immediately, but generally fly using solar panels. When the wind picks up significantly, we will have internal combustion engines that will dampen these large loads including near the earth, during flights, and so on. Therefore, initially, it is necessary to focus on passenger and tourist vehicles, as well as transport vehicles with internal combustion engines, a cruising power plant, and simple gasoline, which is widely available, such as 95 and even 90 grade A92, even 90 grade and 92 grade. At the same time, yes, we will have electric propulsion units, two in the nose, two in the tail, which will be part of an auxiliary power unit, primarily for the purpose of docking the aircraft to mooring masts and canker devices. This is a combined power unit. By the way, regarding the mooring masts, when we were in Kurzach and discussing the devices, the designers mentioned that AU actually had a problematic point where everything would indeed get crumpled if something went wrong during docking. Is that their fault? Will this not happen here? It's not their fault. It's a mistake of such a global level. Unfortunately, everyone has done it not so well. A significant amount of effort is required here, and many things need to be carefully and thoroughly considered to dampen the impact. We have a patent on this matter. No, we didn't proceed. I think it has now been converted into a trade secret. Here it is indeed a very tricky system, but I must say yes, it definitely absolutely requires one person for mooring. But most likely we will abandon this idea because over time, not immediately. We will moor the airships with a cankerous device located on the ground or say, on the roof of a high-rise building in the city center. And here, we absolutely won't need a single human being for this mooring, not a single person at all. And here, I would not like to talk about the specific details or know-how that we are planning to apply. So that we set the task of performing landing and boarding at up to 15 meters per second, because there are limitations for for airplanes, the crosswind limit is up to 15 meters per second, and we should aim for at least that, otherwise it becomes uncomfortable. However, for the airship, it could be 20, 25 meters, which is extremely rare. If it reaches 30 meters, we might just need to take off in a different direction and not use it. This would be somewhat retrograde using high mooring magic, but initially for safety, we will reveal what we plan to do. I wouldn't want to disclose it now, 
It's a know-how. We will get acquainted with it later on the real construction. Well, for now, let's imagine that it will be like a dragonfly grabbing onto some platform and calmly hovering with it. It can feather, stand in a feathered position, and during passenger boarding and disembarking, roughly speaking, we apply certain brakes and the apparatus remains in a static position. We board and disembark. We do everything neatly. And will this be tested on the first yacht, perhaps? Maybe? Yes, this will already be tested on the first yacht. So in two and a half years, we will already... In two and a half to three years, yes. We'll see. So we are starting to get questions. I see one here, and I'll answer it right away. Hello? Could you please tell me if it is possible to make an airship with a lifting capacity of another 250 tons? Even up to 500 tons. Our government has commissioned a study for capacities ranging from 30 to 300 tons, creating such serial devices up to 200 tons. From 30 to 200 we can verify. In the scientific, technical and military fields up to 300 tons, they requested... Maybe in the government decree there is a proposal to use transport airships for the development of Northern Territories with a carrying capacity of 30 to 200 tons, responding. And how high was Tsiolkovsky planning to lift? Tsiolkovsky, regardless of the payload capacity, had designs for a device that was two kilometers long. With a diameter of 300 meters for transporting 8,000 passengers, it was intended to carry passengers. This Frenchman, Henri Giffard, who was an inventor and engineer, had a project in mind. By the way, he was the first person in history to successfully lift an airship into the air. Then he made excellent portable balloons for the exhibition in London and for the exhibition in Paris, each accommodating approximately 40 people in total. In the year 1887, Mendeleev ascended in one of these portable balloons in the city of Paris. Yes, and he kind of came up with a conceptual design for an airship, half a kilometer long. Well, I don't remember its payload capacity right now, but sorry. Well, give or take the orders at least. Well, half a kilometer at least, with modern materials and so on, that's a thousand tons guaranteed. Well, somewhere between 200 and 1,000, I think you can confidently start building. It is understandable to approach this gradually, starting with small devices, but the technology allows it. Yes, there are no fundamental difficulties. By the way, the largest tankers that transport oil and gas can reach 500 meters in length. Here and there, I say, Archimedes' principle applies. Well, the densities are different, and the patterns of load distribution are also different among heavier than air and lighter than air vehicles. They are indeed much more favorable and the air in the devices is significantly lighter. So I accidentally closed the broadcast. No one is writing in the comments. Everyone is asking questions in the broadcast and after reopening it, I can't see anything here anymore. They were asking again if it is possible to ascend into the stratosphere. How high can this whole thing be lifted, and whether it can be done with people? No, well, first of all, we, can, we are planning to ascend to the stratosphere with a stratospheric vehicle. At the same time, it will be an unmanned vehicle, designed to operate autonomously without human intervention. However, it will feature a small gondola, which is derived from our luxurious six-seater yacht, providing a comfortable and stylish experience. This is for all kinds of research purposes, but keep in mind, the gondolas are not airtight, so you need to be in an oxygen mask and so on. Yes, we can. We can definitely lift a certain number of people up to 15 kilometers. But why? Indeed, it's not a business. No, I understand. To see if the Earth is flat. Well, listen, there are people who want to see from space and pay 25, 30,000 for it. Eat 25, 30,000. Pardon, millions of dollars and these commercial millionaires are flying there, right? Are these guys really willing to pay a high price to make it absolutely, definitely well worth it? This curiosity, it should also have a price. 
and then look out the airplane window from a height of 12 kilometers, you will see approximately the same thing. No, well, of course, oxygen masks, if you stick your head out and so on, the sensations will be different. Not on airships, but on these specially designed high-altitude balloons. The Americans set an impressive world record of about 50 or even 52,000 meters in altitude. This remarkable achievement accomplished in the year 1961 by a team of dedicated scientists and engineers is officially registered in the prestigious Guinness Book of World Records. But we suggest for tourism and other purposes to admire this beauty low, very low above the ground. Here, Pasha, thank you very much indeed. Pasha has started asking questions. Are you considering using a 20-tonner for transporting huge loads, such as an empty passenger airplane? Please, with the suspension of a 20-tonner, we can approximately increase it to 40 tons. Yes, 20, 40 tons, and that's with the suspension. We are looking at large, heavy cargo. Yes, considering taking it from the air, so to speak, and unloading it from the air, yes. So another question. Germany and China have design bureaus, airships, and a lot of money. It's unclear why they haven't spread their developments. Well, we really need to have these developments. Everywhere I look, in my observations, there is adventurism. They take and... No, well, there was, there was Roger Monk, a well-known designer, yes, now deceased, indeed. I mentioned Skysha 500, Skysha 700, Sentinel there 1000. He worked for the Americans. Their headquarters was near London. I have been to that headquarters. A serious designer, but he kind of looked at it step by step, including having an airship that was half a kilometer or 300 meters long. I don't remember exactly, maybe a kilometer. A gas carrier for transporting gas. Serious, yes. Hogan Locker, a German designer, is also quite serious. Although I said he became a hostage to his four patents, he still made the new Zeppelin. Wow, this semi-rigid airship is the best achievement to date. And beyond that, I don't see much. Beyond that, it's more like, well, there were airships for advertising. Four or five people until 2001. There are about 50 devices. It worked. It worked well in tourism. They earned up to $5 million a year. It was more or less a business. But they did not aim for a transport vehicle, for a rigid scheme. They are simply, it turns out, afraid of it. They don't know how to approach it. The Dutch rolled out a 20-ton project supported by Congress. And everyone, including cities and others, when I tried to have a conversation, there was Alex, yes, Dr. Alex, the head of this project. It turned out that he is not very good with technology, but he is the chief designer. He introduced me to a young guy, the chief designer, who is about 25 years old. I started asking him a bit about the design, and I realized that he doesn't really understand it properly. It kind of essentially takes as a basis, as a foundation, what Zeppelin had on one hand, it was indeed quite fantastic, but it was extremely labor-intensive. From the perspective of ground operations, it was bad, in terms of efficiency and quite outdated. So we must, 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 must. We worked on it, I don't know. For a long time, we worked with love and found some of these solutions. I also look at life, even though I made up my mind a long time ago, and there, and in my doctoral dissertation, I once considered, yes, these are rigid structures, yes, what dimensions, yes, ground, and near-ground operations should be different. I determined all of this. But I must say that in recent years, original approaches and solutions have emerged, which I also did not feel. It's not easy. And in general, this does not only concern aviation, it's not easy. It's not easy at all. This is not only about aviation, but also about wave vibration.
inventions of this kind, well, let's say, such as airplane, steamship, telephone, and television, for example. There are also about a dozen beings who have turned many things in our lives upside down, and it was these main designers who made it happen. Many of them hit their heads against the wall, so to speak, and indeed were unable to achieve their goals. But those who managed to achieve this, they made progress. They went down in history, so to speak. That's probably the story here. Not everyone who has money can just make it happen. No. Well, Sergey Brin is an example of that, yes. Well, Sergey Brin is probably an example of that. But in the end, why don't countries do it? Countries do. Everyone is trying. Everyone is making an effort. Yes, they are trying. And the Chinese are trying a lot of things. There are as many as 22 aeronautical institutes. But they already launched or certified a copy of the AU-30 last year, as I understand it. Yes, it's all nonsense trivialities. They launched a stratospheric balloon, but it landed somewhere in Mongolia, so it wasn't in plain sight, and it didn't turn out very well. I gave them what you could call a lecture at one of the recent conferences where I was the main guest. They actually wanted to get me to work in China, you know, to be honest. At the level of heuristics, they are still, in general, weaklings. As for rocketry, yes, but they studied in Russia a long time ago, and the technologies there are indeed less advanced. I mentioned this. However, Aircraft technologies and those related to airships, which can be considered equivalent, are actually much more complicated. And this requires art. This is inventiveness. This is art. We need to come up with something fundamentally new. And science, it allows for up to a 20% improvement in flight technical characteristics and economy compared to the prototype. But fundamentally something new? This is essentially at the level of important legal theory. You need to remember the concept of Archimedes and also Ebrick. Find it and try to implement it. We have quite a variety of a few such fibristic solutions. Alexander Nikolaevich, I have a question. I recently forwarded something to you as well. The Americans launched that stratospheric vehicle. Did you see the silver? It went up like a rocket. Oh, that's absolutely completely wrong too, but never mind. People are indeed asking. They are very interested. Are we really falling behind them? How do you generally comment on this phenomenon? And why build our own, let's buy from them since theirs are already flying? Well, first of all, I don't really know these specific flight technical characteristics. I guess they aimed for a semi-rigid or even a soft, flexible aircraft, which works more or less on solar batteries, but it only operated for about a day, and they have reported on this approximately. But they launched it in such wind, for example, probably in the summer, when there is a concept in the north, or rather in the mid-latitudes called a velopause, light winds, and they fought these winds in a quasi-stationary orbit. And if the wind picks up, which is definitely quite likely, say, approximately up to 35 meters per second, or even 40, what will they do? I don't see the power plant on this device that will be able to fight. I don't see the power plant that is ready to fly, well, let's say, over the earth, over long distances, transitioning to repair or something. Therefore, although I have a project for a semi-rigid airship, with an original design that can be patented. We are still moving towards creating a rigid stratospheric airship with a serious power plant that is both efficient and environmentally friendly, with a unique and innovative design, and has the potential to revolutionize the industry. There are also slightly cooling issues with these solar panels, as it turned out. And here are the specialists who work with film solar cells these are the people from St. Petersburg I talked to. When they are on the ground, being ventilated from different sides, everything is good. 
and the required efficiency is ensured. I think it's somewhat impractical. Of course, it's an achievement, but it's not something that would make us say we're falling behind. I don't think so. When we launch our device. In summary, they eventually launched the Toyo for now. Well, I wouldn't say that. Maybe it's actually fine, but then, guys, just reveal your cards, please. What kind of power plant do you have? The power, and what is the volume of this aircraft? They wrote that it took a day to accumulate this energy, but again, it's an average wind. They climbed to an altitude of more than 15 kilometers, around 18, which I think is completely unnecessary. A maximum of 15 makes sense indeed, otherwise it becomes too expensive. Therefore, it's not about outer space, but about development. In essence, fundamentally. A complex, very complex task indeed, so we need to look at something else. I think, in my opinion, this is a detailed and comprehensive sample for presenting interim reports. That is the case. Everyone is moving in this direction, and we will be making serious progress in this direction as well. Not to launch such toys, but rather definitely serious workstations. I wouldn't say there has been much success. The Americans, the Chinese, we have intentions. Augur also tried before, proposing projects. The Europeans attempted it in their efforts too, and it didn't really work out. They attempted it too. So here they are asking. Regarding the control of an airship, they say that recently they flew in a helicopter, got into thick fog and navigated by instruments. How will the same be done with an airship? How dangerous or safe is it? I must say that without a doubt the airship is absolutely and completely and utterly safe in flight. We will have advanced autopilots and there will be a sophisticated system for detecting oncoming aircraft. It will be very serious. Otherwise, you simply turn it on and go, even if there is no autopilot. You could say, you let go of the yoke and it flies. It forgives almost everything in flight. But this does not apply to local ground and terrestrial operations. This is a power supply issue. Here, only skills are needed with the aircraft. Mooring the docking mast and right to the anchoring device. This is what we have worked hard on and what we will definitely implement, which will pave the way for the operation of the airship even when there is fog. And what fog? If we have this. Well, we need to monitor the altitude. Yes, there's the radio altimeter, then the GPS altimeter. We kind of uh, control that and the possibility of this aircraft encountering, yes, colliding with another aircraft. The instruments and sensors are clearly showing us fly calmly and steadily, fly calmly and steadily. <coughs> So, what are your thoughts on using some advanced infrared cameras that have the capability to see through dense fog and provide clear visibility even in such challenging conditions? Other things are of interest here, and they concern ground and underground operations. Sadar, radar. Those that measure the wind and its direction at a distance of, say, several hundred meters, using advanced instruments and technology to provide accurate and reliable data, and we know that in a few seconds this wind will come and we are already adjusting the controls to, well, you understand, to get away from the mooring mast. And while being on the anchoring device, I start to open up again, partially. It would be interesting for us to completely and entirely do away with the tall mooring masts as they require a lot of space. The length of the body, these two, is unnecessary. And when we are on the roof of a high-rise building, and it is in the foligan, we don't take up any space at all. We will proceed in this particular direction, but I would kindly ask that you don't press me too hard on revealing these specific know-hows. Furthermore, 
I appreciate your understanding. All right, I won't press further. There are many questions here regarding various atmospheric phenomena and how they will affect flights. But we have talked about this many times. Let's consider what could be deadly in the air for an airship, what could happen that would be absolutely catastrophic for it. Critical. Nothing at all. Absolutely nothing at all. Absolutely. Tornado, a strike of a hundred lightning bolts in a row. No, no. Well, lightning is the same for aircraft heavier than air. Yes. It usually strikes well. Actually, indeed, you need to have specific protection against lightning. It strikes the tail. Sometimes it strikes the gondola. It happens. So you need to install certain systems there. Uh, but no more than on an airplane. There is no protection against a tornado. You simply step aside, as they say, as they say. Tornadoes are clearly visible in modern conditions. No collision currently. You mean, even if a tornado is expected and we are, say, anchored, we just need to take off and move away, probably to the side because a tornado, excuse me. It breaks houses. It probably breaks houses and destroys, so... And here the flow of the tornado, small hurricanes, large ones? Well, we are obliged, at least as far as the high mooring mast is concerned. I talked about it. There it is, 35.6, I think, meters per second at the mooring mast. It will hold even more. Well, 35 is just... Well, a crazy hurricane, of course, of course. Advertising billboards are flying the city. Yes, indeed, not only billboards fly. Roofs. Already things start flying at 20 meters here. And here, consider that it's twice as much and the dynamic pressure squared is four times the load. There's nothing scary here. Is it possible to rise above this storm front, above the hurricane, and hover there in an airship? Well, maybe it's better to just step aside. After all, it's about him, and that's fine, you know. This is what the Americans did, conducting research on anti-icing and anti-snow measures, deciding whether to ascend or descend to avoid the accumulation of ice and snow. Yes, it is possible and it is necessary. Well, many tasks are related, let's say, to Africa, to the equatorial zone of the globe, where there are no such cold temperatures, snow, and so on. This is also a certain advantage for these regions. This should also be taken into account. But all tasks are solvable. This is just standard ordinary engineering. We live in the 21st century. Absolutely, absolutely. We have already flown into space, even landed on the moon in that century. Yes, and repeating it after that doesn't seem quite right. Back then they invested. Back then they invested. It feels like the engineers used to be more diligent, but now everyone has relaxed a bit because of computers. In the past, there were real men who were given real tasks, but now people are more focused on pure economics and jurisprudence, and engineering has been somewhat forgotten, so to speak. Although we are starting to remember, that's why we have hypersonic technology. That's why the Russians have gained leadership in weaponry. Here are the essential key points to consider in this context that are crucial and important. I don't see any technically unfeasible or aesthetically pleasing tasks for airships. We can definitely solve them at the highest level. One more question if you could kindly answer. They ask. If the airship lifts the cargo with propellers, then why do we need the airship? The airship, a lighter than aircraft, uses propellers to lift cargo, but it is essential because it also supports the weight of its own structure and the fuel it carries. Often these are also indeed typically passengers who are there. We preferably want to fly with passengers mainly using aerostatics almost not using aerodynamics, preferably. And when we transport cargo, the issues of ballasting are extremely important. Well, listen, it's not really a question. It's a matter of ensuring logistics, so to speak. 
I said that there could also be, you know, ballasted devices. I already answered this question last time. If something happens to your propellers, everything will fall to the ground like a stone. But with an airship, it won't go anywhere and will fall more gradually, roughly demonstrating this. We must not forget that even on this 10-ton machine, we have eight engines with 600 horsepower each, and accordingly, variable pitch propellers, even reversible ones. And on the 40-tonner, there are twice as many as 16. If one of them fails, it's not really a big deal for us. It's a multi-rotor system. So, what will happen to the airship if it gets caught in hail the size of a large apple? Such hail recently fell in the neighboring village. All the cars and roofs turned into sieves in a minute. Well, the shell will dampen it. Outwardly like this, right? Perhaps, maybe... The so-called soft under pressure, right? It will be quite resilient. After all, the car roof is rigid and that's why it breaks through and nothing bad will happen. For example, there's wet snow and we don't fly while parked. But if there's wet snow while parked, it can be a problem. Such as, but we have a technical solution. I have a patent, an anti-icing system for how we can effectively and efficiently deal with snow and icing in such cases. Yes. However, as a backup option, we can again steer away from these bad weather conditions, if necessary. Recently, the guys and I were sitting and discussing, winter has come, the airship is outside, and it has snowed. And it has a huge area where it will first lie down and then eventually fall. And we figured, if it all falls, it will fall to the sides. What a pile of snow there will be. Where to remove it? With what tractors? You can't get close to it, it will be covered from all sides. What about this melting? I have one patented solution. There are many serious opinions on this matter, but I think it is an extremely rare phenomenon. Wet snow, not dry, and even in flight, wet snow is usually not a problem. In fact, it doesn't stick, or there is a little bit of ice buildup and we move off to the side. Simply take as a basis, perhaps, this kind of operation that we move away from these bad weather conditions. But tackling it head on also has this solution, melting an air thermal system that allows for this. These are good serious methods of two PhDs, heads of the department. I involved the Moscow Aviation Institute. We calculated and publish these works, and I have a patent on this matter. Will icicles hang from it? No, icicles will not hang down. Beautiful. The question is again about lightning. Can it penetrate the envelope, or how does it work? Where is it distributed? Practical experience shows that the leading edges of the empennage extend into the gondola. This pattern is consistently observed across various models, ensuring stability and aerodynamic efficiency. But we must properly install energy absorbers in the shell elements for optimal performance, safety, and reliability. An energy absorber so that it would hit it. There is a specific receiver, and this energy, as they say, would be distributed in such a way that the structure would not melt effectively. So theoretically, could it break through? Well, if you don't actually deal with it, then in principle it might. Probably it could also pierce the envelope. Although mostly I read there were cases. It hit the gondola, it hit the tail, the rigid element. So you have been in operation for eight years, right? No, we have never had anything even close. There was an issue with a thunderstorm at the parking lot, though. And the electrostatic tension, yes, it needed to be removed from the shell. It was accumulating. And once our technician got quite a jolt, yes, through the mooring mass, through the ground. But we grounded the device. We specifically made a grounding chain with these things. Naturally, we fought in a certain way, yes. I also fantasize from time to time it has a large washable surface. Everyone knows about this triboelectricity, which is generated through friction. 
Can't it be used as a power plant? Well, you know, you've really gone too far with that. No, I think we are actually not really ready for this just yet. All right, next question. Can Russia still create its own stratospheric airships? In the near future, with the special military operation, communication, air defense, and other needs are required. We decided for ourselves that we would engage in this at your request. You decided to designate such a device, a stratospheric one, because commercially we are much more interested in this 10-tonner first and foremost. Then this 20-ton model in the passenger variant, yes, we also believe a large number will be needed. It needs to pay off quickly, relatively speaking, and the dividends should be good, yes. And this task requires the involvement of government officials. There could be huge amounts of money involved. Communication is expensive. Exploration is expensive. Instrumentation, environmental monitoring as well but there must be participation from government structures. Therefore, we are kind of working on it, but we set ourselves the task of lifting such a device within five years. According to our estimates, it is serious. 170 meters long, which is the length of two football stadiums. Wow, yes, it is a very serious device. And everything is correct. Such toys, which are not really toys, were launched by the Americans and so on. We can do all of this. We have the teams. We have the desire to work on this. We will soon show you how we can transport small useful loads there. As I mentioned, we will launch toy balloons. Well, they are not toys, but serious balloons actually. Let me explain. There are two types of balloons. Toy ones are when a latex balloon is inflated with helium, there is a small parachute system, plus a payload, you see like a GoPro camera for example something you want to advertise, it's really just a toy, it flies away in four hours, rises up, explodes, and falls down on parachutes. There are more advanced systems where it transfers pressure from the upper chamber to the lower one, preventing it from rising to where it could explode, and it can even catch wind currents at different altitudes for several days. We can launch such systems in the near future and we'll be launching them. I sincerely apologize. We had a mutual agreement that we would work together on the airship project However, these are merely balloons. We had a clear understanding that our collaboration would be focused on the airship. We won't distract you at all, not even a bit. I would very much prefer if this had absolutely nothing to do with the company we are creating, and so on. I would not want that at all. With airships, this way, you create something separate and independent because of it. That doesn't mean I didn't work on it. I definitely worked on the brought-in balloons. We conducted interesting experiments for the Sternberg Institute, the Astronomical University of Primoskau, and the Kinographic Institute. I earned my first money, and I built Aerostatics 1 and Aerostatics 2 with the money earned from the imported aerostats and from science. Transported free balloons are not airships at all. Airships have completely different capabilities. So let's talk about airships. And don't create separate companies and launch something independent through them. Yes, companies have already been established. People are coming and saying, let's do it, but separately, not connected with those. We will not distract you. No, do not use even the brand or this new enterprise that we will be creating. I mean, please, absolutely do not use it in any case whatsoever. Definitely do not use it at all. Well, solar. Okay. Well, I wouldn't want solar to create just one thing. You can brand. All right, let's agree on this live right now, all right? Well, maybe not on live broadcast. Well, since you said not to. I wanted to do it, and I really want to. Well, you know, you wanted to... You also wanted to build a flying bathhouse, and that's where we parted ways three years ago. Well, let's not generalize any further. Well, why not? If you wanted it live, here you go. I'm speaking. Yes, three years ago there was a situation where colleagues representing our side in the negotiations unnecessarily ventured into the design field and started teaching Alexander Nikolaevich about what the right airships should be, what shape to build, 
and what consumer characteristics they should have, let's put it that way. Alexander Nikolaevich summed it all up with the phrase, flying bathhouse, and here you are making me deal with some kind of nonsense. It happened. Well, don't do it now either. Google had this. They launched balloons into the cloud and they scattered in different directions. Guys, why are you really trying to repeat someone else's success? Please start a company and launch a separate project. Do not associate this with what I proposed with the implementation of the airship. It should be if desired. But I strongly advise against it. Don't do it. Life is short. We are all for making airships the top priority, of course. They are toys, you know. Not the first, but the only one in this project? That's right. And this is in fact done by individual companies. So, in parallel, people are doing everything. We just need to observe. Let's get back to the airships. What we are actively engaged in? Airships, please. Yes, wherever you undoubtedly invest your attention, time and resources, we will definitely follow. Here's a question about the soft and rigid hull and their stability, again in relation to sudden gusts of wind. Can you explain? It's long as I understand the gust there. Well, yes, that's, that's a different story. The entry is in the gust, the nose is in the gust, but the tail is not. But here we will use serious methods to calculate the dynamics, aerodynamics. And entering a gust, modeling these gusts, there are units minus cosine that define approximately three different options, but there is essentially nothing to be afraid of, essentially. Basically, an aerodynamic component appears, but the overload compared to heavier-than-air devices, such as airplanes, is slightly insignificant. We didn't have eight years of operation. No, there wasn't anything like that. Well, there was a hurricane wind and heavy rain, and we had to hold the device in place. In the forest clearing, which was serene and peaceful, it remained quite decent in memory, wet and so on, with a slight chill in the air. But otherwise, there was nothing particularly special. To be fair, it can be noted that the Hindenburg flew peacefully a hundred years ago, and there were winds back then. And if they were able to ensure the necessary structural rigidity back then, calculate everything, assemble it, and operate it so successfully except for the unfortunate end, of course. Back then, especially if you take Count Zeppelin, who flew for 10 years successfully on hydrogen, and nothing happened to him, but if he had encountered such an updraft, downdraft, they didn't know about them. They didn't know about these loads at that time, right? It would have fallen apart, but it didn't encounter a serious gust and therefore PRA actually existed for a decade, for 10 years before it was simply dismantled. Got a bit distracted reading various comments. People are asking, if you increase the pressure in a hydrogen stratospheric airship, won't it fly into space? No, it definitely won't fly away, no. The fact is that the equation for existence at high altitude will not actually work with the ascent to a higher altitude. Hydrogen, the lifting gas, if used, expands. It expands so much that it then needs to be released. Otherwise, it will create extremely high pressure, which will rupture the apparatus. And by releasing it slowly, we significantly reduce this lift force. And that's why it definitely won't fly off into space. Yes, by the way, there were also questions, our internal discussion, about whether it is possible to launch small rockets, for example, first to lift the strategy and then to unload. Yes, yes, this is an interesting question. We have been working on it with serious people. They even approached university professors and academicians of our institute. Indeed, because we spend most of the energy overcoming these 10 kilometers with rockets. The main energy is used to counteract this resistance. And it would be reasonable to lift the rocket to about 10, 12, or maybe even 15 kilometers and launch it from there. We would have gained a lot, but somehow we lack. Bold men like Korolev. 
If there were a team like Korolev's, they would probably set and solve similar tasks. Well, we hope to unite the team in such a way that everyone all of a sudden becomes bold in order to. Well, everyone is being so bold. I don't really believe in that. We'll figure it out. It's a niche product. It would be good to have a few creative guys there who can push everything in the right direction. So, are there any other questions? Yes. They are asking about profit. Why will we all be rich? Super profit. We presented a business plan for the first two units. I mean the yacht and the 10-tonner. Based on getting quick and good profit to show that the project is highly profitable with good dividends. Based on this business plan, we calculated the profit multiplied it by three, and showed you the expected capitalization. So all the profit essentially comes from the business plan. I then basically hinted that we would make it public. You do not need to request permission at this moment yet. We will clarify it. We will complete one plan by the end of the year for a small yacht. But it's not exactly a strong business project. We need it for pilot training and so on as well as for advertising purposes. And the main business project is this 10-tonner, specifically the sale of airships. Its cost will be, well, no more than $15 million, probably a bit less, approximately. And the selling price, we believe, at least for overseas sales, is $30 million. Can you imagine what a huge delta that is, right? And they can be produced serially. Well. Initially, we are talking about 12 units per year. Although there are already 25 units in one hangar, the technologies we are implementing make it possible. Great, such a profitable project that will definitely interest investors in indeed investing in airship-related topics very much. Yes, the amount we specified is exactly for the construction of one hangar for small yachts and two prototype units and the construction of the very hangar that Alexander Nikolaevich mentioned, capable of producing up to 25 units of 10-ton capacity per year. We heard what its selling price will be and what the delta is. How we calculated the capitalization based on the most modest estimates, and also the profits as well. Well, you should probably be concerned about profit. First and foremost, capitalization. Well, capitalization might also be a serious factor, yes. How much their shares are worth, undoubtedly. Yes, they are asking if there are any customers for them. As mentioned today, people have already called, saying they'd take them for any price, just to outdo the neighboring side. You see, it's such an untapped field, you know, right? Many would really like to see a finished device, at least in Asia, you know. It's definitely an incredible and amazing opportunity. I assure you. All right, a small yacht, but when we lift a 10-ton one, yes, the advertising world, well, I'll allow myself such an expression. The advertising world, yes, will be over the moon with excitement, yes, about the use of such a device. And there will definitely be a huge number of customers and we will be thinking about the price at which to sell the devices. Yes, I posted it in the chat. I can resend it, but it's better if you find it yourself. Or Sergey was sending them. In general, we were sharing videos in the chat where all the private jets are listed with some crazy prices, starting from the least expensive to the most expensive. And these are all clients for these devices in any case. But what about a serious client like Roscosmos? How do they see further cooperation. This is not a serious client. They are indeed somewhat short on money. Here we need to rely on something else. African countries, for example, where both the transport apparatus, passenger services, border security and other needs are concerned, will pay money and such tasks will be addressed. No, of course, our country will definitely develop but it might be frustrating for it to see that we create devices but do not implement them. 
There is absolutely no doubt that the requirement will undoubtedly be crazy. And actually, in the near future, we need to not only take into consideration cereal production and sales according to the business plan, but also aim at creating enterprises for operation. The main money, well, at least in aviation, one ruble is kind of in development, 100 rubles in mass production, the ratio, yes, 1,000 rubles in operation. In other words, in operation, one can earn 10 times more than in mass production, but the investments there must also be entirely different. Therefore, for now, we are choosing a scheme to collect relatively small amounts of money to be able to start mass production. Yes, as I explained earlier, this is that unsinkable business unit when it reaches self-sufficiency and can develop at its own expense. Of course, with investments, everything will be much faster and on a larger scale, but... Excuse me. Mass production is planned, and this is the base from which we will move forward. And if we aim for this kind of significant operation, no, and mass production, there could already be billions of dollars in annual revenue turnover. And if we aim for operational processes, there are tens of billions of dollars annually, and even hundreds if we look seriously. So there is a lot of money involved. Is the question generally speaking clear? Is an unmanned airship also possible? Also? Yes, absolutely. The stratospheric vehicles will be unmanned. If we are going to develop Russian forests, it should be done using unmanned aerial vehicles such as drones in a sustainable and efficient manner. And some special tasks for the Ministry of Defense and the Ministry of Emergency Situations. They could also be unmanned, not immediately, but in the future they could easily all become completely unmanned aerial vehicles. That's why I asked the question. We will strive towards this, but primarily focus on these tasks of stratospheric devices and, for example, the development of Russian forest, which is reasonable exclusively in an unmanned variant. Well, yes, there is currently a boom in drones. Many are converting airplanes and helicopters into unmanned vehicles, which has been clear for a long time. Right now, cars, drones and other equipment, both surface and underwater and so on. Naturally, we will follow the trend and explore these options as well. We have the specialists, so everything will definitely be done. They write, we want a lifetime token for investor space flights. Hooray! 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 A lifetime token. Does that mean we indeed guarantee that we can always, always give him a ride? And how much will it definitely cost for him? No, a lifetime token. He became an investor and is planning to come and take a ride. Sergei Semenov already replied in some chat that the flight is free for investors. The question is, is this token lifetime? Well, yes. They will definitely, absolutely like it, you know. Only the elite will remain in Russia. Yes, the scale at which this industry needs to be developed to provide free travel for tens or even hundreds of thousands of investors considering that everything else should cover the costs. You need to calculate this with our help, probably with our participation. Well, overall, the two hours passed unnoticed. We answered some questions. Not all. Let's wrap it up. We always try to keep it within 40 minutes, but it turns out like this. Does it work out at 40, right? No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't work out. But we will strive to reduce further, reduce, although I find it interesting, you find it interesting, if so, give it a like. Share the links, ask more questions, and feel free to join us. We will all be here at 4 p.m. In general, join the webinar on Tuesday. More precisely, don't come by yourself, you are already immersed. Invite new people. On Tuesday, we provide basic information. If you haven't been on Tuesday yet, come and take a look. There we will explain in detail what the first funds will be spent on. 
It's exactly about that very sustainable business unit that will become self-sufficient. Hopefully, I hope my cold will be gone by then. Stay tuned for a video about Kirchach and follow the news on social media. Thank Alexander Nikolaevich with a like and a repost uh, for coming today. Alexander Nikolaevich, could you tell us who you will invite here next Thursday? Well, we agreed. Or on Friday. It's unclear for now. Next Thursday. But you did say Friday. Friday. Thursday seems to be busy. And it was agreed that it might be three hours instead of five hours. This is Ivchenko Boris. Here, we will coordinate the topics with him. And in a week, my deputy will be there. The first one, sort of, Kuznetsov Andre. But I thought he would talk about the stratospheric project since he will be the deputy chief for the stratospheric project. But since he is in charge of business planning and other things, he prefers to talk about economic models and business planning. I think there are no objections to such a topic. Yes, I think not. Everyone is interested. The depth of elaboration of both business plans and the economy as a whole. Moreover, he is also a lecturer at the Faculty of Economics at the Moscow Institute, giving lectures in this field. Perhaps he preferred to prepare some notes. He might also have a few slides. But that's in a week? In a week. That's how we planned it. A week and then in a week. But I came today to cover the embrasure, so to speak. You guys are so abrupt. You call in the evening, yesterday, today. Be kind, my dear. Cover up. But yes, we are in the pre-launch phase. We constantly talk about it. But we haven't yet reached a state of consistency. Everything is being adjusted on the fly, and we are working and not sleeping. As Pasha says, we don't leave the office. We will settle everything, agree on it, and move forward harmoniously. I really hope so. Thank you all. It was nice to have you with us. Bye-bye.